Thank you very much for coming. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a, uh, um, a framework that I'm um, intimately involved with, um, both in terms of using it and as a uh, part of an Erasmus Plus funded um, project um, that I'll mention at the, at the end of the session. And then um, we're due to stop the BioConnect at quarter two, um, but then, or around about then, and then at two o'clock, I'm going to run a sort of another workshop, which is a bit more sort of interactive and in trying to get um, you to sort of think of ways in which you can use this, this framework um, to help with uh, um, developing our assessments and how we think about assessments. Good. So what on earth is this EAT thing? Um, so the idea behind EAT is it's a model um, that's designed around um, a big meta-analysis of a huge number of papers to do with assessment that tries to distill characteristics of a good assessment into a small number um, of dimensions that helps to sort of um, direct what a, a good assessment could look like and how we can improve them and that sort of thing. And to try and show how all of these things are interrelated with each other. And I'll maybe explain um, what I mean by that interrelatedness um, slightly later. This is a, a nice little quote from the original um, EAT document. And I really, really like this as a concept. Um, and yeah, a key sort of thing that underpinning this as a framework is involving students actively in the, in the assessment process and the assessment design process and getting them to be active agents in the whole um, activity. And, and so, you know, what it says here is how do we get students to co-own um, the, the assessment that they're involved in and to co-own those practices and not see assessment, assessment as something that is done to them. Um, you know, I think an awful lot of assessments in, in university are focused around the idea of um, students having to perform something. And it's almost a, um, almost like, a, a, if you say, a punishment of the, uh, the learning. They have this big assessment at the end. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of assessments are also really helping students um, work towards uh, developing their learning, helping them um, develop confidence, competence, skills, and those sorts of things, understandings. And so, you know, and we do an awful lot of that in, in biosciences. Um, and, you know, how do we get students to see that? How do we get students to see that as they're part of that assessment process? So to say these core concepts of student partnership really underpin EAT as, as an idea. Um, and that's active partnership with students, both in terms of engaging them in class and engaging them in terms of designing and revising our assessments. Um, so student partnership in terms of de the design of the assessment, and that's not you design an assessment and then see what the students think about it. It's bringing the students into that design process and um, getting them involved in um, helping write the guidelines for an assessment or making assessment accessible to all types of learners um, and reviewing and improving those assessments year on year. We can always improve even if we've got something that's really, really good. Um, and then we've got the idea of active engagement with them actually in um, the learning sessions and in understanding what that assessment is all about so that they have kind of like ownership or um, they're kind of integrated into the assessment it's not something they've got to go somewhere else to find out about and then do independently they feel part of that as a part of their learning um, and to use all of the resources that we provide them um, to to help their their learning effectively on the right hand side I've got assessment literacy and that's both students and staff understanding what potential assessment has um, what requirements the, the, the assessment they're doing has, um, how that benefits their learning, how it fits into a larger scale of their development. Um, it's understanding what the use of feedback is and that sort of thing. Then in the centre is kind of something that really underpins everything. And that's um, the idea of helping them develop themselves as self-regulated learners. Um, this is something I'm very particularly interested in research wise, but trying to get them to understand how they learn. Um, get them to plan that, get them to moderate that, get them to develop the skills to be able to learn independently. Now, what do I mean by self-regulation? Um, oh, sorry. So I would, I would argue the ideal position we want to get to in terms of using assessment as part of a learning process is that by the time a student graduates from our courses, they don't need us to evaluate their work or 
they need very minimal uh, input from us to evaluate their work. And um, they can identify broadly their strengths, their weaknesses, and those sorts of things on their own. So the key answer ar argument is then how do we take student from the moment they walk in the door as a year one student where they're very um, dependent, they're very, um, they require us um, to drive an awful lot of the learning to the time when they walk out of the door, when we would hope that we, they'd be able to write something, critique it, see where it needs to develop, where it needs to, to change. Um, so that in the world of work, where there isn't uh, an academic looking over their shoulder, giving them feedback, they can do that independently. Excuse me, just one moment. Sorry, I had a terrifying feeling my, one of my dogs had disappeared. Okay, what did I mean by self-regulation? Well, self-regulation is, there's various different models of it, and anyone who's doing any of the fellowship programs at the moment will have come across me banging on about this. Um, but it tends to have sort of three areas to it. And these, you know, so self-regulation, the ability to regulate your own work, to manage your own work um, independently of having someone doing it for you. So at the very core of it, this is a nice model I like um, by Monique Burkhart. So the core of it is being able to regulate your own way of learning, being able to learn effectively, being able to understand things and think about things, the cognitive strategies, if you like. In order to get those right, you need to be able to have metacognitive strategies. So those are being able to identify whether what you're doing works or not, being able to um, see if the learning strategy you've got revising for an exam is effective and if not how to change it then in order to regulate all of those you need to have the metacognitive dimension which is being able to identify the, your goals the the reason you're learning the things you're trying to move towards so how do we get students to be able to be effective in each of those um, three domains through the assessment um, that we give them so eat itself as a framework um, is based on an analysis of a large number of um, articles relating to assessment. Um, so Carol Evans, who designed the, uh, the framework, um, I think she's done an in-depth analysis of about 3,000 papers and a more broad brush analysis of about 50,000. Um, and what she did with that was identify the key things that seemed to be impactful on a, an assessment that made it effective. And what she then did was try and distill those into as few different dimensions um, as possible the, of you know, characteristics of a good, effective, student-centred um, assessment. And it's called the EAT framework um, because it's, EAT stands for equity, agency and transparency. Um, and those are sort of key things that sort of underpin an awful lot of the ideas. The I idea that students should be able to compete on an assessment on an equal basis um, based on their, um, their, well, based on their cognitive abilities and cognitive skills rather than a whole load of other factors. Agency is um, students having an active role in that assessment. They're not just passive recipients of that as an activity. And transparency, which is getting the students to understand how an assessment works, what the backgrounds to it are, what the reasons for it are, how it's processed and that sort of thing. So you define those things around three core areas, assessment literacy, um, assessment feedback and assessment design. And I'm just going to talk about each of those different areas in a little bit more detail. And each one has four um, key uh, areas that underpin it. And the idea behind this is to really sort of focus our ideas on thinking about the ways in which we design an assessment, the ways in which we um, communicate the requirements of the assessment to students, and the ways in which the students then engage with that. So the first of those is assessment literacy. Oh, sorry. And these are the uh, all of them and how they all fit together um, on a little sort of diagram. I'll come back to this diagram and how you can use it in a minute. Um, but the idea we're trying to get across with this is they're all interrelated. So the one you can see in the top right, what constitutes a good outcome um, to a uh, um, an assessment um, from the student that links to ideas such as you know providing accessible feedback and clarifying um, how the student what entitlement the student has to support and those sorts of things so the first one of those is assessment literacy 
assessment literacy is really getting both students and staff to understand what assessment is about, what the parameters of it are, what we want from an assessment, what they can get out of an assessment. So the first of those dimensions is clarifying what counts as a good outcome. So, you know, to what extent do we say to the students, you know, these are the marketing criteria, this is what a good um, response to this assessment would look like. How do we engage the students with that? How do we get them to understand what we want them to do as part of an assessment? The second one is clarifying how assessments fit together, both within the module and in a broader scope of things. So students can see the assessments as part of a learning journey and part of a, a broader idea of things, rather than just a whole load of random stuff we're giving to them because we have to generate a mark. So, and again, from a staff point of view, thinking of actually thinking about how those assessments fit together. Um, it's quite difficult to do in the structure we have for our modules in year two and year three, where everything is um, um, optional. Um, but trying to think, for example, in, in a single module, how do the assessments fit with each other? How do they fit with the um, course that we're providing, the curriculum we're providing? The third one's really interesting, and that's clarifying student entitlement. And that's what the student can expect to get in terms of support, um, guidance, advice, feedback, um, and those sorts of things. So a key thing with that is getting students to understand that we are not an infinite resource. We have a fixed amount of time that we can allocate to each element of their learning, and in particular um, towards their assessment. And so if they want support, where do they want it? Do they want it at the beginning, in the middle, at the end? They can't have all of that. Um, so getting the students then to sort of own that choice, getting the students to understand what sort of feedback they'll get and when they'll get it and what um, we expect them to do with it proactively rather than after we give it to them. Final one of those is clarifying requirements of the discipline. So how does this assessment fit in with the needs of being a bioscientist? Um, why are we giving them this particular assessment? What's the relevance of this to them as a professional? Um, and the idea of authentic assessment of assessments being linked to some sort of professional activity the students will be doing afterwards. Feedback ones um, are really guided around do we provide feedback or providing feedback that encourages the students to be self-regulated, to be independent by the time they graduate. So the very first one is accessible feedback and that's does that feedback make sense to the student? Um, you know, the comments we give meaningful. So are we you know, giving them guidance or are we just saying good, bad, but excellent, tick, cross, question mark? Um, those don't mean anything to the students. So you know, are, is the feedback we're giving directed and meaningful? Do we provide opportunities for the students to act on that feedback to change their behaviour within their learning? So that really prompts us to think, when are we providing that feedback? Is it on a summative assessment at the end? Is it on a formative assessment early on? Um, is it on um, guidance at the very, very beginning? Um, so are we giving them a chance to change, to realise what they're doing is good or realise what they're doing needs, needs to change and to alter their behaviour accordingly? The third one is looking at, do we try to encourage students to talk to each other about what all of these things mean? So to get to talk to each other about the, the criteria, to get talk to each other about their ideas, to share ideas, to critique each other, to review each other, to learn how to criticise themselves by looking at someone else's work. So this, you know, the idea of sort of peer feedback and peer analysis with this really, really helps in that dimension. And then finally, to, and this is a real, really important one, I think, with feedback is does our feedback promote that student in becoming an independent learner, someone who can assess their own work, who can evaluate their own activities? Um, or is it, a set, is it um, feedback that just tells them what's right and what's wrong? Are we getting them, are we equipping them with the skills we need them to have to be able to critique themselves? And in some cases, that's a case of actively getting them to critique themselves and guiding them through that process. The third area is um, assessment design. And that's a little bit more sort of nebulous. Um, and that's more about how we think about revising our um, assessments, how they fit in with a broader scheme of things. So the first one is ensuring robust and transparent processes and procedures. So, for example, do we tell students what happens to their assessment after they submit it? Do they understand why we have this four week um, deadline, for example, um, for the return of feedback? You know, that, do they understand what... Um, 
uh, scrutiny um, they undertake, what moderation those things take. Do we um, explain to them, for example, in some cases we do a social uh, marking exercise to start with to make sure everyone's pitching their marking at the same level. Um, that's a key thing that students often complain about is, oh, my, my assignment was marked by so-and-so and someone else's assignment was marked by someone else and that, that person's a harsh marker. So I've done best, you know, they've done worse than I have. Meaningful and focused assessment, again, is thinking about developing skills they will need um, for when they, uh, when they leave us. Is our assessment actually developing skills that are important for the workplace? Or are we doing something that's quite artificial? Ensuring access and equal opportunities is important. So with the old, you know, the old idea of, you know, your assessment is to climb that tree and the people doing the assessment are a monkey, um, a squirrel, an elephant and a tortoise. You know, so those don't have the same ability to do that assessment before you even get to the idea of whether they're high achieving, low achieving and that sort of thing. So ideas around students with disabilities, but also students who have particular personal situations um, or um, don't have access to uh, technologies themselves and those sorts of things. Finally, the very final one is, do we have a process for evaluating our assessments as we go along, not just looking at the mark in an exam board, but looking at how students engage with the assessment, what needs to be changed about the guidance, what sort of um, help we can provide the students within the parameters of the workload that we have. So in a lot of those cases, we will be doing that really, really well. <laughs> So I'm not putting this together to say, oh, you know, that we, we're absolutely dreadful and these are all things that we're, we're useless at in biosciences. Absolutely not, not the case. I think in a lot of cases, we really hit good um, top benchmarks with, with some of these, these factors. Um, but the idea of using the EAT framework is to sort of maybe, well, you can use it in two ways. You can either take a, a more global point of view and look and see what are the areas that um, we're doing well, what are the areas that we might want to improve and then use that to focus on those areas. So you're using your time um, effectively to have the maximum input. Or you can use it in a very micro level um, to help guide students through elements of, a pro of a, um, a, uh, um, an assessment. Now, what we're not sort of advising people to do is try and do everything all at once. Because um, if you try and hit all of those 12 dimensions in a really, really deep way, um, no one has time for that. So you can't do everything in a really detailed way unless that's your only job. So what sort of things can you do with big changes um, using, using the EAT framework? So a good thing to do is use it as just a basic diagnostic tool. Um, and I'll show you um, what I mean by that in a moment. Um, to get staff and students to take an assessment or a set of assessments or a year's worth of assessments and say what are we doing well what are we not doing well and seeing how the students feel about that how the staff feel about that and seeing where there's areas of overlap or areas of difference or you could pick one of those 12 dimensions or a couple of them and focus on that primarily across the school so this year we're going to focus on making sure our feedback is encouraging students to be self-regulated or self-analytical, um, or we're gonna focus on engaging students actively with marking criteria, something like that. You can use them as a set of principles um, or guidelines for putting an assessment together, either in terms of looking in, and reviewing an individual assessment and seeing those areas you might want to sort of um, develop a bit. So areas of guidance you might want to make a bit more explicit or areas of things that you haven't got there or areas things that actually you, you do um, um, have really, really explicit. And it's useful as a tick box exercise when you're designing a new program. So you know, when you're putting a, a new module together or a new degree together and you're designing assessments for that, Using those 12 dimensions to say, are you hitting each of those sorts of benchmarks um, is a, a useful way of, of sort of having that as a, an aid memoir sort of thing. And through all of those, you can help manage student assessment um, expectations about assessment. So that first one is something that, sorry, the key thing with all of that is engaging students actively as partners in that process. Um, not just do it and then see if the students agree with it, but get them involved right from the word go, get them um, helping you um, query whether or not a particular um, 
that you know what the, the good points and bad points about a particular assessment are looking at the guidance you give for a particular assessment and um saying are there are any areas of that that aren't clear to them or they'd like a little bit more um detail so that global approach um, is something we tried in biosciences a few years ago um, and um, with year one. Um, it never then got sort of followed up because then Sheila, who was running it, um, migrated to, uh, to Bristol. Um, but it's a, a good thing to do and it's something we'll try in the, uh, in the workshop afterwards if you want to stick around for that. So the idea of that is this wheel um, that has each of those 12 dimensions on it and a little description about them. There's a lecturer version and a student version. Um, and what you can do, for example, is get the lecturers on the course to um, evaluate that on a scale of one to five for each of those dimensions, one being not doing it very well, five being, yep, yep, we're really hitting that. Um, and then get the students um, to look at that and then comparing the two. Um, so, for example, you know, we've got the blue line being lecturers and the green line being students. Um, it could be that um, the lecturers in this case, think that they're really clarifying the marking criteria, but the students don't. Um, so that's an area you need to focus on to guide the students and help sort of engage them with that a bit more. Conversely, there could be some areas where um, the staff think they're doing very poorly. Um, I thought I had an example of that. Oh, okay, let's say here, clarifying the results of the relation to the discipline, but the students actually think, yeah, you're hitting that. So that's something you don't need to worry about. That's something you can maybe share as good practice with, uh, with other people. And some areas where you both agree it's high or both agree it's low. So it's kind of a, an, a way of identifying where the bodies are buried. <laughs> um, so you know, finding out what are the problem areas and what are the good areas so you know what to focus on and what actually um, is perfectly okay and, and doing really, really well. So as I say, the other sorts of things are you know, picking an individual dimension and then um, doing a broad brush approach with that. And within the EAT um, document that I've put on that shared um, folder, um, right at the end of it, there's a series of sort of colored cards about each of the different dimensions. And they've got examples of things you can do as a teacher, as a um, student, get the students to do, or as a program director or module um, designer. Um, so, you know, these are a series of questions for that first one. What does good look like? Um, so, you know, do the, does the team itself, the module team, have a clear understanding and a shared understanding of what a good outcome of this will look like? If not, what can we put in place to make sure that that happens? Um, do we know what constitutes or do we agree what constitutes good academic practice across that discipline? So it's a series of questions that you can think about and maybe sort of use those to guide how we're, we're doing things in a more global way. Equally, you can do it at a very micro level, and we've got really good examples of people doing that. So it could be that you take, um, use, use this, look at a single um, assessment, look at all the dimensions on that single assessment, and it might prompt you to make some very small changes. It could be as, as little as just adding a paragraph to a, a module, a, a um, a set of guidance for an assessment, or it could be um, changing the point at which the assessment delivered or um, providing an opportunity for um, to talk with students about elements of that assessment. Um, focusing on one single dimension and doing some sort of activity that uh, works with the students around that. So like I said, um, we've got these um, these little sort of cards with the uh, um, framework that has examples of sorts of things you could do now by no means do all of them but they're just sort of throwing out ideas of things that might work might help um, might be useful so again we've got here a, a series of ideas that um, staff can do um, or staff can put into their teaching sessions and here's a series of activities that um, students could do. So getting them to produce a model answer based on some criteria, getting them to mark um, something. And I know these are practices that we already do in biosciences because I've been, been involved in some of them and we've been doing them for many years. And again, that's a key thing with this EAT framework is a lot of people when they um, use it to have a look at their assessments go, oh God, yeah, we've been doing that for a decade. Um, and that's quite nice actually, because then you've got sort of like proof that actually what you're doing is brilliant. Um, and research, you know, research informed as well. So, you know, you could, um, as I say, focus on one particular dimension and get some engagement with the students around that. It doesn't have to be a big thing, 
Um, I mentioned some examples of how we how people have done that. Um, it can just be spending five minutes talking about students about it to students in a lecture. It could be doing a little video about it. It could be um, adding some more explicit guidance. Um, this one, third one, dis discussing logistics and entitlements with students that might really help manage their expectations around assessment. For example, in uh, the concepts module in year two, yeah, 250 odd students on that module, getting them to understand that processing that number of um, assignments doesn't happen overnight. Um, that's a really sort of key thing. Um, and then, yeah, using the framework to think of activities that you can do. And that last one, involving students in, re in revising and reviewing the, uh, the guidance that you give to them, um, is a really good um, way to do it. And get those students to go through each of those dimensions and say, is that clear from the guidance we give them um, when we do that assessment? Again, involving students actively in that is the key. So here are some examples of uh, how people have used or are using um, the framework at the moment. So uh, in Biosciences a few years ago, we did that idea of getting the staff and the students to evaluate the, uh, um, the year one assessments that we gave them. Um, that identified areas that we could improve and uh, and get students involved in actively changing those. And it did lead to a few um, sort of changes we made um, in year two. Um, I used it to uh, look at um, assessment I have in the cell. We have in the cell biology uh, module in particular to do with them understanding um, how to work um, as a group. Um, so I sort of introduced a few sort of midway feedback um, type of things and that's sort of using that dimension of do they get the feedback at a time when it can help them change their behavior a feedback two I think that one is um, in chemistry at the moment um, a colleague over there is using it as a framework to help guide placement students to understand the marking criteria by doing sort of weekly activities with them um, in the English language um, department of NCAP um, they're doing a whole load of exciting things um, one of them is a very simple thing, get the students to understand the criteria. Every week in a teaching session, they spend the first five minutes talking about one aspect of that, those marking criteria. So one week it's um, structure, another week it's critical analysis, another week um, it's use of evidence and so on. Um, just five minutes discussing that with the students, getting the students to ask questions and answer questions and so on. Um, and by the end of it, you haven't, you haven't taken up a huge amount of your teaching time, um, but the students have got a better understanding. Um, and there's another colleague who's introduced a portfolio assessment instead of an end of module exam um, with a series of small um, activities they have to do as, as it goes towards the end of the module. So, again, they get feedback constantly um, on how to improve. In healthcare, um, they use, they're use thinking of using it as a tool to look at their assessment and feedback across the school um, and to identify areas where they need to focus on. And in uh, the National Software Academy in the Computer Sciences, again, they used the framework to guide, as staff, to guide how they were going to design and, and develop the, uh, the guidance they did for their assessment. Cool. There's uh, lots of resources and things on um, the EAT um, website um, to my Carol Evans. We're going to have more resources um, going up around that. Um, some of them are a bit deep, some of them are a bit detailed, but that's because we're trying to sort of get as much idea and many ideas in there as possible. One thing I've put on that um, in that folder is something we've called the self-regulatory report. That is about 85 pages long, is incredibly dense and very um, pedagogical. <laughs> um, we are going to start dissecting that out into a number of smaller resources, but if nothing else, what we've got in that is about 20 or 30 summaries of key papers and there's a big list of references at the end. So anyone who's doing fellowship applications or, or would like a bit more um, information about assessment, have a browse through those, um, even if you don't go into the really dense um, stuff about self-regulation. As Heather mentioned in his uh, um, introduction, um, the email introduction the other day, um, the reason I'm involved in this is I'm leading a an Erasmus Plus funded project. We were lucky that we got into the Erasmus Plus um, system uh, just before the UK government in its wisdom pulled out of it and uh, managed to get a, a project funded um, quite substantially nicely um, which we're almost exactly halfway through 
Um, it's a collaborative project um, between um, Cardiff, um, University of Mino in Portugal, University of Zaragoza, Zaragoza in Spain, Illyria College in Kosovo, um, a professional organisation of geographers in higher education called Eurogeo that's based in Belgium, and um, Sheila Michi Dargan um, in University of Bristol is one of the partners as well. That QR code there, I think, hopefully, um, links to a, uh, um, a little um, form, a Google form, uh, not, uh, an MS form, where you can ask to sort of sign up for more more information. It might, however, be... Uh, I've got the... Ignore that one. I've, I've got one at the end. So those are the people in, in, involved. The aims behind that project are to try and develop resources that people would find useful um, for assessment and feedback practices. So we're working on the basis that we don't have those guidance at the moment. We've got this framework. It's very dense. It's quite complex. It's uh, got a lot of... Um, when you look at it, you sort of have a bit of a rabbit in the headlights sort of um, response to it. So how do we dissect out that and help people develop different areas in a bit more focused detail? So that's where we really would like to come to you and get your ideas of what you would find useful so that we within that project can uh, spend the money and develop them. Um, we also want to understand the differences between institutional cultures across Europe and between different uh, um, universities across Europe. Four major outputs for that. The first one we've pretty much sorted now, which is um, this idea of focusing ideas around self-regulation. And that report is a, a kind of summation of a lot of that. Um, and again, I've put that as a link in the uh, um, I'll put that in the, uh, the shared document I linked to at the beginning. Um, I'll hold on, pop the that link again into the chat. Um, and again, that's quite dense, but hopefully can be used as a bit of a sort of a source material for anyone who's interested in specific areas. The main one um, is developing case studies. So what we're trying to do is get people to pilot the project in either a big sense or a small sense um, and give us examples of how it worked and how it didn't work. You know, what things did you need to help? Um, what engagement was there with the students, what worked, um, what were the calamities and that sort of thing, so that we can provide a whole load of examples of um, using the framework across a range of different um, disciplines, um, countries, um, year groups, module types, assessment types and so on. So you'd be interested in doing one of those and, and trying something out. I'd really, really like to hear from you um, so that we can sort of um, get some feedback on you um, with that afterwards and produce this nice sort of smorgasbord of examples um, within our project. The third one is developing um, some training resources. That is the right QR code, but I'll put it up at the end um, of um, things that people need to help them. Um, we're also designing a MOOC, um, which I imagine um, Sarah Hall will giggle at. <laughs> But it's not a small adventure um, that's going to sort of focus all of these sorts of ideas together. And then finally, um, we're developing a sort of a framework for um, standards and, and recognition. So people who do these activities and, and develop their, their assessment activities can get some sort of recognition for that. Cool. OK, um, I'm happy to um, pause for any questions. Um, but if not, then anyone who'd like to try these out a little bit more um, sort of actively and a bit more interactively. Um, stick around and then on the same link, um, I'll start a workshop at two o'clock. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a link and I'll try and <coughs> put these in the chat in a minute of you know, something to just sign up in case you'd like to be kept informed about the project, any outputs, um, maybe um, do a case study or just have a chat about how to implement each with your, your work. On the right, um, again, there's that link and what resources you think would be useful um, so that we can get an idea of what the sector out there actually wants. Cool. OK, I'll just um, stop sharing so I can share those uh, um, resources. But happy to answer any questions. <laughs>